it's interesting that the word cataclysm in English comes from a Greek word, uh, kataklusmas, which means flood. Isn't that interesting? And if someone says it was a cataclysmic event, in English it's just drawing on a Greek word, which is the word from the Bible that means a flood, a deluge, a complete washing away. And this book records for us the only first-hand account of when God killed every single living person and animal on this planet, except for eight people that were in a boat. You know, it's interesting, in the Chinese language, you know, the word for boat, do you know what it is? It's a little character. It looks like a boat, and it has eight stick figures in it. Guess how many were in the ark? Eight. Isn't it interesting that every single civilization on this planet that have written records going back, 240 of them, every single one of them record that there was a flood? Isn't that interesting? 90% of them say that eight people lived through it. And you know what? About 85% say that they took all the animals in the boat with them. You see, what we're looking at is something that slumbers beneath the ground you stand on. When you got up this morning, your house was sitting on top of layers of remains that prove that God destroyed the whole world that existed in Noah's time. When you walked out your driveway or went to the parking lot, underneath that parking lot are little bits of bones and shells, fossils and layers. And those layers are a very silent but a very graphic and powerful witness to the fact that God destroyed this planet. You know, a University of Chicago fellow that, that works with population studies was just playing around, and I read a report last week that said that according to his computer calculations, if you factor in uh, ethnicides, genocides, plagues, uh, catastrophes like hurricanes and tidal waves and tsunamis and, and things like that and, and, and migration and wars, if you factor all that in, he said that the number of people we have on this planet had to have started within the last 10,000 years. I thought that was really interesting. From the University of Chicago, you know, that, that he would figure out that to get to the number of people we have, if you look at the way that, that, that people survive disasters and if you just backtrack it on a computer, that the population of this planet can only be about 10,000 years old. That's interesting. You know what else? The fellow that invented carbon-14, you've heard of the amazing carbon-14 dating that they're always telling you that this bone is 4 billion and this rock is 6 billion and all that. The man that invented carbon-14 said that there is not a single object on this planet made by a human being that's more than 6,000 years old. Now, that's, that's the unbelieving scientist that invented carbon-14 dating. He said there's no evidence that humans have been on this planet more than 6,000 years. Now, if you postulate through all those layers that we're going to see tonight and the next few weeks came from the flood, and if you use those as evidence of billions of years, then you can, by finding a bone in the bottom layer, say it's 6 billion or 4 billion or 300 million years old. But the people closest to the facts know that there's not an evidence on this planet of human life being here that they can verify more than 6,000 years ago. We're going to see why. And if you want to turn to 2 Peter 3 with me, you can take some notes if you'd like. I'm going to give you some specific points that Peter brings out. Before I do that, I want to read to you something that I found. Because as a junior high boy in the sixth grade, the age of 11, I remember sitting in the front row as a, a revered scientist from Michigan State University, which was in my town growing up, East Lansing, was speaking. And his name was Dr. John Whitcomb. And he was a amazing man, and, and he was speaking many years ago, 11, I was 11, I was 30 years or 29 years ago, and I still have my notes. And I want to read to you what he said that day, about 29 years ago. You know, it's still true. This is what he said, and as a little junior high boy, I, I never forgot, I kept that old paper, and it's all tattered, but I still have it. We have been living in an age of deep skepticism. A century of evolutionary philosophy with its seeds of naturalism and atheism has yielded the bitter fruits of revolution, non-moralism, and despair. Nevertheless, even in such an age as this, God has not left himself without witnesses. And that he did good and gave you rain from heaven, rains and fruitful seasons, filling your heart with food and gladness. Acts 14:17. He continues by saying this, there is another yet silent 
yet powerfully eloquent witness in the very rocks of the earth's crust, in every nation, in the land beneath your feet, and in the hills and valleys through which we travel, reposes a vast cemetery. Therein lie the bones, the shells, the teeth, and the trails of innumerable animals, along with the compressed and carbonized remains of the immense forests that once filled a beautiful world. Here and there, scattered widely throughout the rocks, can be found artifacts or other fossil evidences, even of the human life of long ago. Modern speculation has managed to distort the testimony of this sedimentary graveyard into a fictional record of slow evolutionary development over a billion years of imaginary Earth history. This strange notion has indeed today become accepted. It's even taught as scientific fact in most of our education institutions all around the world. By the way, uh, this was back in 1967. It's far more prevalent today. Fossils, however, speak of death, not of development. Their witness is one of extinction, not of evolution. The God who created all things is a God of both power and mercy. He need not and would not have used the principles of suffering and death, especially a massive and violent death implicit in the fossil witness. By the way, there are parts of the country where there are crammed together in small valleys and places there literally hundreds of billions of animals squashed. Did you know in Siberia they have found the remains of five million woolly mammoths? And those woolly mammoths are crushed as if something came on top of them and pushed them down. Many of them are kneeling and many of them that are fast frozen, quick frozen in the ice when they have excavated them, they have found not only have they crushed looking up, but between those gigantic woolly mammoth teeth, they have found fresh flowers that they were chewing on when they were killed instantly and crushed and then frozen. And their, their flesh still remains frozen in the Siberian permafrost. Now, now how did that massive, uh, violent death come about? Did it come about over billions of years? I mean, there were hundreds of millions of bison that were killed here in, in this part of the country within the last 100, 150 years. Do you see any bison fossils laying around? Do you dig them up? Do you find hundreds of millions of fossils? No. There's no real evidence of all those buffalo that were killed off in the slaughters a century back. Things aren't getting fossilized. There's no violent squashing of animals going on. There's no production of coal going on in this planet today. There's no fossil fuel production of petroleum going on. Where did it come from? Well, God did not implement death and violent destruction in his creation. Fossils speak of death, and death speaks of sin and judgment, not of creation and development. When correctly interpreted, whether theologically or scientifically, this worldwide witness in the very earth itself talking about the flood and all the signs of it, testifies of a sovereign creator who controls and judges his creation, not an evolutionary progress over many ages. The stones over which we walk cry out concerning a judicial termination of one age on this earth when God stepped in and destroyed everything that had life and breath. The biblical record is complete. It alone has a first-hand account of that great hydronamic convulsion with which God judged the wickedness of the antediluvian world, pre-flood world. Whatever geological problems may be suggested, there can no longer be any question that if the word of God is true, and I believe, and the man that wrote these words many years ago believed it, the Genesis flood was a world-covering cataclysmic judgment imposed by the strong hand of God. Probably there's nothing, in, in end of quote, there's probably nothing that is more easy to see when you travel around this world than the evidences of this global cataclysmic flood. The Grand Canyon of Yellowstone, where did that come from? The petrified tree sticking up in Specimen Ridge. I mean, there are ten layers of them, and they don't have any bark on them. And they're standing upright with root balls through layers and layers of, of sedimentation. Where did those things come from? They could not have been petrified through those layers because those layers on the evolutionary time frame are hundreds of millions of years old. And that would have decayed before it would have petrified. How did it get jammed in that layer? Well, 
let's look at Second Peter chapter 3 and see what God has to say. Since he alone with Noah and his family witnessed these events, because the Lord tells us what to do when you find yourself living in a world that denies their maker. Second Peter chapter 3, beloved, this is the Apostle Peter at the end of his life, fruitful life, full life, uh, serving the Lord. He says, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. What he's saying is I'm going to repeat myself. That's a kind of a gracious way to say it. I'm going to stir you up by way of reminder. And I want you to get this riveted in your mind. Verse 2 of Second Peter 3. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now, now he's building to a point that we're going to come to about verse 3, scoffers coming. But what do you do when you live in a world of scoffers? Point number one, you might want to write this down. If you're living in a world of scoffers, trust the word. And that's what this whole series has been about, the book you can trust. If you're living in a world that's denying its creator, and if you haven't noticed, we are living in a world that's denying its creator. And if you're living in a world that's denying that that, that creator is bringing the world to a point of judgment, a, a point of reckoning, a point of accountability for the life, life that each one of us have lived, if we're coming to that point and the world's denying, what should we do? Well, number one, he says in verse 2, be mindful of the words spoken before by the holy prophets, that's the Old Testament, and the commandments of us, the apostles, that's the New Testament. Trust the word. You know what I have written in my Bible by verse 2? Trust the word. When you're living in a world that's denying its creator and denying that the judge is coming, what should you do? Trust the word. Why? Because it's going to be attacked on every hand. Even the men that write the classic textbooks that are used in universities around the world and from coast to coast, even those men, if you read them carefully, come up with conclusions that they say, if, if we interpret the geologic column as having any type of water effect on it, then there is no way that this stuff is as old as we think it is. I mean, these guys write this in their textbooks, but then they say, of course we know it's old because they dated it old. But if we at all believe that there was a rapid sedimentation on this planet from some type of cataclysm that was global, then it's very easy that all this happened rapidly. But we don't believe that. But you see, they, they put these brackets around it, but they have these nice little nuggets. Okay, number one, trust the word. Number two, verse three, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust. Number two, after we trust the word, expect scoffers. What are scoffers? They are people that will do everything they can to make you not believe this book. You know, I, I heard a, a wonderful testimony this week from someone that told me how they came to Christ. And we were sitting uh, over on 71st Street, and, and they told me that they went to a, uh, a denominational church just up here in town a little bit, and they were an unsaved person. They were attending this church with their family, and they, they just started listening to the hymns. And in Sunday school, they said, in Sunday school at this church downtown, they said, you know, I believe Jesus did great miracles. The pastor called them that week, invited them, this person, into the pastor's office and sat down with them and said, you're bordering on fanaticism if you believe that there were miracles performed by Jesus. The disciples in later centuries wrote all those stories into the Bible. Jesus did not believe in miracles. He did not rise from the dead. And he did not do any of those things that the Bible says. And you're bordering on fanaticism if you believe that. So you better be careful. Now, that was right here in this town about 17 years ago. And this young man was so challenged when the pastor told him that, that he went home and got a Bible out, his parents' Bible. And he says, God, help me. And he put it down. Now, this is not the way you should study the Bible, okay? Don't you do this. You're not unsaved. Help me. Dropped it open. 1 Corinthians. He started reading 1 Corinthians, and he was so convicted. He was a high school senior. So convicted that that book spoke to his heart that he dropped right there and trusted Christ as his Savior. Went back to his pastor and said, not only did Jesus do the miracles, he did a miracle in me. And he was unwelcome at that church. Anymore. They said, you're a religious fanatic. Out. You know what? Scoffers are here. Verse 3 says, expect the scoffers. 
As people run amok, as, as one person wrote, in sin and every form of debauchery and ungodliness, they will become more and more impervious to God's truth, and they will be resentful of his standards of righteousness. See, what happens is, if you don't believe in the living and true God that has revealed himself that's in this book, then you've got to invent your own God. And most likely, it'll be someone just like you. You know, when the Greeks invented the mythological gods, the whole pantheon of Greek gods, you know, mythology... Cupid and Apollo and all that stuff, they invented gods that were just like them. And their gods were always having little faux pas and little affairs and little problems and little things because no one would invent a god like the god of the Bible. Who would want to have a god like that around? Because he will call us into account, so we want to invent gods a little less than that, and that's why evolution is so nice. We're gods. You know, we determine our destiny. We're looking for artificial intelligence or we're looking for some extraterrestrial people that will tell us some secrets how to get rid of AIDS and cancer and aging and everything else. But we don't want a, a personal God that invaded this planet. Well, as time goes on, our world will get so vile and so wretched and so preoccupied with sex, drugs, alcohol, materialism, and pleasure-seeking that they will believe every explanation that can be given them for the end-time signs that God's going to give. Do you ever wonder that? How are people going to ride out the tribulation? How are they going to ride out the rending of the heavens, the convulsions of the cosmos, the demonic hordes God is going to unleash on this planet, the, the sun scorching the earth, the water supply totally being poisoned, death and carnage everywhere. How are they going to ride that out? They're going to be worshiping the demons that come to plague them, and they're going to be so preoccupied with self-gratification that they're going to be exactly like the generation that lived while Noah built the ark. I mean, Noah preached. I mean, he didn't just build that thing for 120 years. He preached for 120 years. And he warned the world that God was going to destroy the whole world, just like we're supposed to be. You know, you should have a little bit of, of uh, enthusiasm in your witness. The people you talk to, if Christ came tomorrow, they would be on a seven-year death ride where half of all the people on this planet are going to die a more grisly death than Stephen King can write about in his books because it's going to be real and it's going to be inescapable and it's going to be horrific. When God lets man be trapped on a planet with the hordes of the demonic world that are going to be gathered and just kept on this place. I mean, if you've had any dealings with the occult, bumping into the occult once is enough to keep anybody away from it that's sensible. But how would you like to be trapped on this planet with demons fiendishly intent upon destroying you and having no way to defend yourself? Well, the scriptures say we should expect the scoffers. They're coming. In the days of Noah before the flood, they were eating and drinking. They were marrying. They were giving in marriage. If you look at 2 Peter 2.5, it says in that verse that God did not spare the ancient world but he saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, and he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly. Now, did Peter believe in the flood? Yes. Did Jesus believe in the flood? Yes. Did Moses believe in the flood? Yes. Did the apostles preach about the flood? Yes. Did they believe it was a local overflowing of the Tigris River that was localized somewhere in Mesopotamia? No. They all taught it was a global, cataclysmic destruction of every human being. How many people were on the planet back then? Well, if you look at the same guy that, that projected out the, the population figures and used his figure, there were probably one to two billion people when Noah lived. Billion. Did you know it was a very advanced civilization? Did you know it must have been incredible to live on the world back then? Have you ever thought about coal? It takes 40 feet of organic material compressed at the right temperature and the right compression to make a one foot thick seam of coal. They have found seams of coal 20 and 40 feet thick. You multiply that out, that means that there had to be vegetation 1,600 feet thick that had to get squashed to make that seam of coal. Did you know we can't grow vegetation like that on the planet today? Have you ever thought about the fossils? We don't grow animals like that anymore either. They don't get that big anymore. People don't get that big anymore. Did you know the footprints they found of human beings 
in the fossil strata, they, you don't hear about this. They aren't very often in the books. But if you look back before the 40s in the fossil books, you'll find that, yes, they have found human or human-appearing footprints. And those footprints are large, 15 inches, a lot of them. People were bigger back then. Animals were bigger. Trees were bigger. Everything, just, it was kind of like living in a resort back then. And God destroyed them, 2 Peter 2, 5, because they would not respond to the gospel. The scriptures say those people laughed when Noah spoke to them about the flood. They'd never seen rain. they never heard of a flood. Probably the earth was, had a vapor canopy. That's how it appears that God made it. And, and there, was no, there was no knowledge of, of a flood. It just the earth watered itself. It didn't rain. It just kind of was like a mist that, that came out, kind of like a sprinkler system that comes in the dark. And you don't even know it's there, and it does its work. They had never seen such a calamity, so they discounted the idea. And they went about their daily routines in Noah's day. They ate, they drank, they married, they did business as usual. Until God slammed the door shut. And when the water started coming down, and when the fountains of the deep started spurting forth, and most likely that term in Hebrew means not just water, it meant the volcanoes started erupting. Did you know that the Columbian Plateau that goes from the Pacific Northwest all the way over to Wyoming and down is 200,000 square miles of volcanic eruptions? When did that happen? When did this planet get like this? During the flood. And God says all the evidences of the flood are for us to remember that people who are untouched by God's truth and who don't understand their perilous situation need to be warned that there's another cataclysm coming. Well, not only should we trust the book, and not only should we expect the scoffers, but thirdly, look at verse 4 of Second Peter uh, chapter 3, back there, verse 4. And we're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Thirdly, we need to resist the lie. Look at the lie that's here. The people that are scoffers, this is their scoffing, verse 4. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. There is one word that's a scientific word that's used for what this lie is that is being perpetrated in science and perpetrated in all of our schools across the nation. It's called uniformitarianism. You know what that means? It means that everything has been non cataclysmically intervened with and that just for all these countless of hundreds of millions and billions of years the earth's strata has been building up like this and just layer after layer after layer and therefore there, that there was no cataclysm and therefore it's taken all these 4.6 billion years for it to happen verse 4 all things have stayed the same from the beginning that is Satan's lie you know what comes with it coming with it is the idea of evolution, an impersonal God, that you and I have animal ancestors, and all of it happens by chance. That is the lie. Uniformitarianism, evolutionism, animal ancestry, and chance with an impersonal God out there that kind of started the whole thing. Mr. Bang, you know, Mr. Big Bang that, that started the bang, but he's never come back. That's the lie. What's the truth? The truth is that it's not uniformitarianism, it's cataclysmic judgment. That it's not evolution, it's creation. It's not an impersonal God, it's a personal God. It's not animal ancestors we have, we have the image of God. And that's why when people really, really get quiet and think about it for a little bit, there's this little gnawing inside of every human being on this planet. St. Augustine called it a God-shaped vacuum. You know how he put it? He says... We are restless until we rest in thee, because thou hast made us for thyself, O God. It's not chance. It's purpose from God. Resist the lie. In my Bible, I write, trust the word. Expect the skeptics. And all along the ride, resist the lie. I mean, I see it in the magazines. I see it in the paper. I hear it on the news, the lie. I mean, it's even on the road signs when you drive through Wyoming. This strata is from 640 million years ago. I look at that sign and I say, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Even our highway department promotes evolutionary, impersonal, uniformitarian, 
chance animal ancestry. Resist the lie. Number four, verse five, says the fourth thing we should do is affirm our creator. Verse five, for this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Not by chance, not by bang, not by time, not by process, not by spontaneous generation of inorganic into organic deals. By the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water. That's why we think of the vapor canopy. It seems like God had water around the planet and then the earth and there was water in the planet. And that's why it was like a greenhouse. And that's why things grew so big and people lived so long and, and all that. But what this verse talks about is a creator did that. He just spoke and it happened. Number five, look at verse six. Remember the judge. By which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. The world, everyone, everything. Some of you maybe haven't been around long enough to ever have studied Noah and the ark. It's one of the most fascinating studies in the world that I've come across. I mean, I've read every book I can get on this, and it's just been boggling how incredibly detailed. I mean, even I was telling some of the folks, I mean, it, it even gives the chronology. It's fascinating. God says, on this day he shut the door. On this day it started raining. On this day it stopped raining. On this day the ark rested. On this day the door back opened back up. Why did God give all those dates? Because a little bit later on, they correspond with events in the Jewish ceremonial worship calendar. But number five is, remember the judge. These people had no excuse for their sin. Before Noah began building the ark, they saw the power of God. But for 120 years, they didn't listen. And that was more than ample for anyone to repent that wanted to. God gave them that long. Listen to what Spurgeon said. He who does not believe God, that God will punish sin, will not believe that he will pardon it through atoning blood. The same people that wouldn't believe that God was going to flood the world certainly wouldn't believe that they needed a Savior. And the people you talk to today and I talk to today that don't believe God's going to call them into account, that don't believe he's going to resurrect them in a, in a physical body to stand before him and to answer for themselves, those people who don't believe in judgment don't need atonement. What do I need it for? This is all there is to live for. There's nothing afterward. Spurgeon continued and he said this, I charge you who profess the Lord not to be unbelieving with regard to the terrible threatenings of God to the ungodly. Believe the threat even though it should chill your blood. Believe it though nature shrinks from the overwhelming doom of hell. For if you do not believe, then disbelieving God at one point will drive you to disbelieve God at other points of revealed truth. That's what's happening today in Christendom. We're having an unraveling. People don't understand doctrine in the Bible, and they say, I don't believe that. And what happens is because they don't believe that, it's unraveling other points of the Scripture. I like what is recorded about Socrates in ancient Greece. There's a young man who every time he saw Socrates in Athens, he said this, I hate you because every time I meet you, you show me what I am. Did you know people hate us because every time they meet us, we remind them of where they're going, of who they're denying, and of what that person they're denying has promised is going to happen to them? We need to keep remembering the judge. Number six, verse seven says this, we should escape the fire. It says in verse 7, For the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. We need to escape the fire. We need to learn the parallels of Noah's day to ours. In Noah's day, God's message was rejected just like today. In Noah's day, there was wickedness, immorality, violence, lewdness, vulgarity, profanity, lying and killing and blasphemy. It was rampant just like today. In his day... A remnant found grace, and there's a remnant that believes today. In Noah's days, or shortly before, Enoch was translated out of this planet, picturing the rapture of believers, which we are going to experience, or a generation perhaps not too far removed from us. 
Someone once said, if God doesn't destroy our world, he'll have to apologize to the pre-flood world and to Sodom and Gomorrah because we're living the same way. Well, here's the last note. Look at verses 8 and 9. If we are to trust the word, verse 2, if we're to expect scoffers, and they're here, verse 3, if we're to resist the lie, verse 4, if we're to affirm the creator, verse 5, if we're to remember him as judge, verse 6, if we're to escape the fire, verse 7, then here's the sweetest note of all, verses 8 and 9. Let me read them to you. But, beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Now, what does that mean? I have heard that played with endlessly for making the earth, you know, be endless years long. No, 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 no. God is outside of time. With God, time is not a problem. I mean, with him, a day is a thousand years. Or a thousand years is just a day. We could put it this way. A billion years is a second, or a second is a billion years to God. I mean, you can make it as big as you want, because God is outside of time. But why did Peter say this? For the next verse. Here's the emphasis. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Everything's on schedule. Time doesn't matter to God. He's got it all planned out. As some count slackness, but he is long-suffering toward us. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what the last point of this message Peter gives us is? Seek the Savior. Seek the Savior. While you hear his voice, while you feel the knock of his spirit on your heart's door, seek the Savior. Think about the terror that those people in Noah's generation felt when the first raindrop hit them. They'd never felt rain. And here, they're all gathered around mocking this old man in this big boat with all of his animals. You know, he was a real animal lover, and, and he took them with him. And, and all of a sudden, they heard that as God shut that door. They thought, well, that's interesting. How'd they do that? And then, as they were standing laughing at Noah, carrying on, whack, the first raindrop. Anyway, what was that? Whack, another one. The sky gets dark. And all of a sudden, the rain starts coming. They thought, oh, this is neat. Something new. So they went home and woke up the next morning, and it was, you know, this deep, starting to come in the house. And they looked out, and that boat was still out there. And all of a sudden, at breakfast, they said, wait a minute, that old man said something about was going to, water was going to come down out of heaven? Maybe we better go back and talk to him. And they went up there, and the door was shut. Someone wrote this. It will be a moment of sheer terror when unbelievers face a holy God and realize with absolute certainty that they are eternally lost. That must have been the feeling of the people in Noah's day when they saw the flood waters rise above their heads and knew the door to the ark was unalterably shut. Seek the Savior while you hear his voice. Trust his book while you have an opportunity. Live life expecting scoffers, resisting the lie they give, affirming your creator, remembering he is judge, and just live a life that will escape the fire. And that only comes by seeking the Savior. If you've never bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, you can do it right where you sit. Let's just bow for a word of prayer. Oh, Father, I thank you that you are long-suffering. I thank you that personally you were patient with me, that you knocked upon my heart's door and drew me to yourself, as all of us who know Christ can confess. I would pray that this would be an incredible time of worshiping. The blood that was shed, the body that was bearing our sin away. But Father, if Perhaps there is one who is with us that your spirit has tugged upon the reins of their heart. And they realize that the door will be shut for them. And they perhaps are experiencing for the first time the conviction of your spirit. May they just cry out in their heart of hearts to you, Lord Jesus, that you would please forgive them, cleanse them, 
that they might accept you who died in their place. You aren't looking for a formula or a cute special prayer. You're looking for a heart that is throwing itself wholly upon Christ as their only hope. Oh, Lord, how we pray. As believers have gathered, if even one unconverted, lost sinner is here, that they might come before you, O Christ, and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I accept the sacrifice of Christ on my behalf. Because of the sacrifice, the blood, and the righteousness of you, O Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.